So today I just want to talk to you about, um, from the research perspective and the future research perspective of that, of where we're going. So we've heard a lot about, and it's, it's true, what Rod said and others have said is we have a lot of information. We can actually move forward. We need to move forward. We need to change what we're doing. But at the same time, there's chances for things to come in that are coming over the horizon or have the potential to come over the horizon, which we should be taking into consideration as we're going. So I'm going to cover where we're going with that. Um, I'm going to start with the fact that I, I guess everybody here knows about CSRO, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation. We've been going for on about 100 years, large government funded research organisation and as part of what we have to do, we occasionally stop and look at where, we, where we're going and what we're doing and are we still doing the right things. Some people would call it navel gazing but you know, we do it and, and a couple of years ago we went through a major one and we were looking at all the different parts and one of them was what we were doing in urban. And what we actually determined was that a lot of research that we do has an influence into the urban area. Uh, the number one that we always spruik is Wi-Fi. We all know that CSIRO developed Wi-Fi and it's made a major difference to the way the world goes. But we do a lot of things, have done a lot of things in urban water, in energy and other things. And, and we, we, all this research comes in. And when we actually started to bring everybody together to discuss the urban, all our business units actually said, actually, yes, a lot of our research has an input into the urban environment. The only one that actually hasn't responded like that is actually the, app, the space business unit. Um, they're probably too busy looking at the stars, but we think they'll come in because they're the ones who develop Wi-Fi, so we think they'll come back eventually. So we started to look at this and we realised that we needed to do things differently. And a bit like the way our urban developments exist at the moment, we just do our research in the way of, you know, we look at, there, sewage or water supplies, energy, and we look at it as a bit and see how it fits in. And that's how, in fact, our cities all develop. We get those bits go in here and, and we saw bits from Rod and others that people talk back and forth to get um, the approval for the sewage, the approval for the energy inputs, and there's very little discussion across the different areas of what happens. And we realised that we needed to do things differently to have an influence on what was going elsewhere. Looks very convoluted, don't get too excited about it, except for the fact that um, you know, we need to have a systems approach. If we're talking water, what's the influences on people, on the environment, on the energy? If we're talking energy, there's huge inputs across the other ways. The urban greening, the urban heat that we're talking about covers a huge bit. We need to look at it so that we can take the place and we can actually move our urban environments from where we are at the moment to a new place and try and move as fast as we can to that new place, keeping Australia relevant in the global um, facility. And of course, that's what everybody else needs to do. So as part of that whole planning process, we came up with this concept that, I mean, it's nothing new, but for a CSIRO, we would start to do our research in an urban living lab approach, principally because we didn't want to do just research in the laboratory and then try and push it out. As researchers, as we all know, Australia has a problem moving research from the laboratory to uptake. It's a huge problem for our, for our nation. And we want to do it in real world conditions. Not only for uptake of our research, but also there's this, and I deal with it quite frequently. We talk to people and we go, oh, we could do these things. And they go, oh, it sounds great, but we can't get in the way of what we've got to do. You can't delay it. It's because there's this common concept that see, uh, the researchers are going to come in and say, oh, this is going to be great. Just give me 10 years and I'll really research it to the, the nth degree and I'll give you all this data that you can work with. And, and, and by the way, I'll get a couple of conferences and, and journal publications out of it. And of course, everybody goes, but I've got to get this building up now, which the reality is, and the truth is, there's some, some of us are like that, but the reality is we can work side by side. And so we need to work as researchers and learn how to work side by side with industry and government about how to improve things. So to date, we have three urban living labs. We have one up in Darwin, uh, one in Western Sydney here, um, and then we have the um, old CSIRO um, agricultural site uh, in Ginandera, um, which being federal government always moves a little bit slower than everything else does, but it's hopefully going to be active very soon. The other two are already moving ahead. What we also realise is this is great for us to do our research as CSIRO, National Research Organisation, federal government says, go out and do this. But the other thing the federal government said, which we had also recognised ourselves anyway, was we can't do this alone. 
We're not that great a huge a research organisation. So it's a place that we can actually facilitate. So we are, it's actually an open facilitation, encourage anybody who has a great idea that they want to test out. So we're not talking about things that we know work now. We want to see stuff that come in that is just coming off the lab, that is we're not quite sure how this is going to work in the real world. And we want to test it in the real world. So we're open for and inviting and partnering with other universities, with industry, with government in these places to test things out. The other thing that we know from a lot of consultation from experience is that change in cities, as you know, takes a long time. It, city development and, and morphing and stuff, it's not like a mobile phone. The, the change in the technology of the mobile phone has been huge. Cities change a lot slower, so we need ways we can get in and test these things out to get them in as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you can miss the boat. The 10 years is not um, feasible for uh, getting innovation into cities. It's just too slow. So I'm just going to talk about these two urban living labs quickly, trying to keep to the, the time limit. So Sydney Science Park, it's actually 440 hectares out in Western Sydney, three kilometres from the Badgerys Creek Air, um, Airport within the Aerotropolis. It's owned by a company, Celestino, developer company Celestino, who we've had a, a partnership with a long time for a long time about various things. And when we were testing out this concept of the Urban Living Lab and we went around to a number of our stakeholders, they said, we've got this new place, Sydney Science Park. We think it fit, our vision fits your vision. Great. So we're dealing with a developer. The developer is keen to deal, deal with all sorts of researchers and other things. And again, we are facilitating this place. It's a green, open cow paddock. Uh, I think I can safely say it's not the best quality soil. It's been used as a cow paddock for a long time. It's got the chance to do things. Celestino see it as they have their own vision of turning into a vibrant place of over 150,000 people living and working on site. We've got the chance to go in and test things as they go on. So it's a great green open green field. But not all places in, the, in um, Australia are greenfield that need research. So Darwin came up. Darwin has got money from um, the city deals, federal government funding city deals. Again, Darwin has the chance to be um, the uh, gateway to Asia on the north. It has its own issues. It has a unique climate, as we all know, uh, depending, it could be two, it could be three, five or nine um, seasons, depending on whether you take just the fact that it's disgustingly hot or really dry and hot, or if you take the First Nations, who have a very a rich um, form of, of seasons. In fact, we ran a symposium in December there, and we experienced the change of the seasons while we were there. The first two days, I'm from Brisbane, and I'm thinking, actually, this is actually easier, better than Brisbane at the moment. What's all the thing about? And then stepped out on the Wednesday, I went, my God, this is terrible, uh, because the dew point had just gone straight up after the thunderstorms, which you can see my photos there of the thunderstorms. And, of course, they've got um, unique... Um, wildlife and tourism potentials that they want to accentuate on and they need to move forward. So this is another place where we can work with, which is already an established city that needs to and wants to change significantly. And what's one of the common things that we have is, and of course fitting with this presentation, is urban heat. And we all know about heat-related health risks and, and hot points and, and Rod and others have shown this. We know about the fact we need smarter homes. But coming to the core of it is it's a in fact, this is quite a simple one, probably too simple. It actually requires a, a huge input of different parts, and that's what I'll showcase as where these urban living labs are going. Darwin, just as an example, um, it's, as I said, it has huge amounts of urban heat in a dry tropical climate, although, as I said, um, it can change from a dry tropical climate to a very sticky, wet tropical climate very quickly. There's been some really great um, heat mapping by the University of New South Wales, um, showing some really hard places. Um, so the thought is, you know, these are the areas to, to green and, and the likes. In a way, fortuitously, it sounds strange to say fortuitously, in 2018, Cyclone Marcus came through and Darwin lost 40% of its tree canopy. This gives us an opportunity to then go back and say, is it just trees? How do we get trees back? So it's not just the trees, but how do we get new trees in? How do we facilitate it? What else do we need to put in apart from trees? Is it the water? Is it uh, infrastructure with better adobe um, or adobe, whichever way you want to pronounce it? All these different things. And it's going to be this systems approach that works together. It's not a simple, let's put in more trees. 
even trees with great canopies. And it's the type of trees we need to put in. Most of the trees that were lost are non-natives, the shallower roots that can't take these cyclonic conditions that come through. And of course, Western Sydney, um, we've already had a fair bit about it. I won't allude to it too much. It's been hot and it's getting hotter. The, the middle one there is actually um, some press releases that happened when we first launched the Sydney Science Park Urban Living Lab. And it just in a way, fortuitously happened while we had a large stretch of, I think it was a week and a half of 40 degree heat. And the media really picked up on this and the um, interest from the community was huge in the fact that they, um, we reached over a million people with that. And of course, just showing an example, Penrith Council is really moving towards that. So we're starting looking at what can we do around urban heat. And is it greening? But I, I probably should have changed this from greening as I was thinking through it to actually cooling for decreasing urban heat. And you know, it could be trees getting trees in and its other parts. And where we're looking with our urban living labs is both that, as I said, that green open space, which is going to be changed to urban. And what can we do to design it from the bottom up and learn as we go through that that learning can go out to the rest of Australia. But also like Darwin, where we can take in existing points and partner with people who are doing research elsewhere to compare knowledge, to actually put um, things into existing infrastructure. One of the things we're doing just at the moment is actually this is out at Sydney Science Park, we've got sensors in. So we're actually collecting baseline data because as these urban living labs are gathering momentum and people are coming to us saying we want to do this research here or we're trying to do research there, we need something to compare to so we know we're making a benefit. Um, this is Jeff who's actually here at the moment. You can see him at our stall and he's actually looking around at these things, probably from what he told me, chasing a calf out of the site because they've got cows on site still and the cows get into everything and they tend to... I had out some water sensors, which we'll see some examples of, and they managed to push through star pickets on angles and flatten the whole thing, chew on wires. The things that we put up with as researchers sometimes is, is difficult. So we've got baseline. We also have a base, getting baseline around um, weather and, and, and air quality. We're getting baseline around water quality. So then we can start to map what's coming from where. There's one of the um, systems that the cows trashed and they had to put a great fence around it. Um, we can work out what sort of water and how are we going to bring water back into that landscape and, and the sorts of things Josh pointed out. It's planned properly where it is and we can actually work towards smart systems that supply the right type of water at the right place at the right time. Not just a blanket approach, but it's actually providing... The topic, we don't need to be providing potable quality water to a tree. Trees don't need that, they, but we have to provide it in smart ways. And when you move on from that, then we can actually also look at the energy. So we're looking at wind, supposedly out in Western Sydney is no good, although we've got a wind turbine being put up at the moment, and the first two times after they delivered the facilities on site, it was blowing the strongest I've set, it's been blowing out there for a long time. But what can we get out of wind that can be part of the whole picture? We've got of course, solar and how much solar radiation we get on site so we can design to make this as, as energy neutral as possible. Hydrogen's been looked at considerably. And of course, what can we do about the infrastructure to mean that that infrastructure, again, I'm not talking about what we know already, but what can we trial that's innovations coming across the horizon that's the aim that we have. And then finally, just to finish off, this is by no means go in six months and then run away. The intention is that we're doing things for long periods of time. And the way that we talk about it in research is, of course, we put outputs. That's the re research results, the things that we put out. Then from the learnings of that actually can make a change. So we'll see the outcomes where people are building different buildings in different ways and we're seeing those, those being built elsewhere. So the learnings are spreading out. We're comparing and contrasting. And finally, we have the impacts where we're getting better livability and the likes. And of course, in the outputs, nothing is perfect in research. We learn as we go. So there's feedback loops and we can keep on improving because this is a long-term approach that we've got. I could talk a lot about this, as you can tell. I've given you a snapshot here. Happy to talk to anybody about this over the rest of the day. Thank you very much.